So now let's look at, you know, we did um, sensory integration. And I'll just go back a few slides. So if you kind of remember, if we look at this, uh, let's take a look at maybe this picture here. And you saw how, you know, we talked of sensory integration, which meant that we said how sensory fibers, let's say something was pinched or touched or something on your skin, how the impulses went th into the spinal nerve, and then they went into the dorsal root ganglion where they had their nerve cell body and they entered into the spinal cord. And if you remember, I said then it travels from here, it goes all the way up into the brain where most of its synapses in the thalamus, which was the sensory relay station. And then from there, it goes into the parietal lobe of the brain, right? And I mean, it may go to other areas too, but we were talking about how that's how sensations were integrated. How does your brain, or if it had to go to the cerebellum, how does that know that sensations are coming? So now we are going to talk about how, how motor nerves, we know motor nerves begin from this ventral horn. And later we'll see in the case of autonomic fibers, they begin from the lateral horn. But ventral horn, they come out through the ventral root, get into the nerve, and then they go to skeletal muscle. How exactly are these ventral horn cells, how are they influenced? What kind of influences them? How do they know that they are supposed to act, right? So that's what is meant by motor integration, which is what we are going to look at here. So if you look here, one first thing is that motor neurons in the ventral horn, they can be stimulated by neurons in the spinal cord itself. So in other words, you could have a sensory fiber coming into the spinal cord, like for example here, so a sensory fiber coming into the spinal cord, and then from there it makes contact, as you can see, with the motor fiber, and then the motor fiber goes out and goes to skeletal muscle. Can you see that? So shown up here. So it could be at the spinal level itself, and which we'll see in the next few slides, what is known as a reflex or reflex arc. So that's one. The second is that the spinal cord is under control of the cerebral cortex and the brain stem. Remember when we were doing the lobes of the brain and we talked of the um, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. And remember in the frontal lobe, we said there was a gyrus called the precentral gyrus, which was this one, which was called the motor area of the brain, right? And that means that was the one which controlled voluntary activity. We all know that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, contralateral. So these fibers actually come down, they cross over, and then they go to the spinal cord, right? So that's what this is basically saying, that in the, at the middle level, from the motor cortex or even from the brain stem, you have impulses which travel down, which are called descending tracks, and they will come to the anterior horn cells and influence them, and then the anterior horn cells take it to skeletal muscles, right? So they are influenced by the cerebral cortex and brain stem. In the cerebral cortex, it was that motor area which we talked about, which we said was responsible for voluntary muscle activity, okay? Then the other level and final level is the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, also called basal nuclei. If you remember, I said one of the functions of the basal ganglia and the cerebellum was to make sure that activity remained coordinated, right? So you have to have a coordinated muscle activity. Uh, remember I told you that if I asked you to touch your finger to your nose, you can do it really well. You know, you know exactly how much on how far to go. Your finger is not jerky. It kind of touches that. If I tell you to do the movement of flexion extension, uh, sorry, supination pronation really fast like this, see, we are able to do it. We kind of don't uh, stagger like this or go this way, right? All of that control is because the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, they make sure that everything is coordinated. They remove unwanted movements from the body. So you only do what is required. So you can see that that is the highest level. So from this cerebellum and basal ganglia, they get sensory input and then they sort of process that information and then they send impulses all the way down to the spinal cord from where the anterior horn cells will go out. So that is basically how activities in your body are carried out, how muscles react, okay? So that's what is meant by motor integration. Now let's look at this one. We already saw the, you know, the other ones, the cerebellum and the, and the um, motor cortex. This we talked of, remember there were fibers 
called descending tracks. So we had tracks which came from cerebellum. We had tracks which came from the uh, brain, uh, from the motor cortex. Like we remember, I called them spinal, uh, sorry, corticospinal tracks. If you remember when we were doing tracks in the spinal cord, cortex to the spinal cord. So that's what these are. Now let's look at how the spinal level is, is done. And this is the best example of how the motor horn cells or ventral horn cells are controlled by impulses within the spinal cord. The best example is what is called a reflex arc. So imagine you touch something hot, you immediately pull your hand away. And it's only after some time that you actually feel the pain or the burning sensation. Your hand gets pulled away even before you actually feel that sensation. Because in order for you to feel that sensation, remember that awareness and perception, in order for you to feel that information actually has to go all the way up like that first synapse of the thalamus and then from there go up that way. Remember we had those things. Now it take that would take too long and from there an impulse has to come down and go to the anterior horn cell. That would take too long. So instead you have like a re reflex which is occurring at the spinal level itself. And here you can see, imagine, suppose I was saying like I touched something hot and I pulled my hand away. So the receptor begins in the skin. From there, the impulse travels via sensory fibers to the spinal cord, where it synapses on an interneuron. Interneuron is between two neurons. This connects the sensory to the motor neuron. The motor neuron goes out and goes to the skeletal muscle and you take, pull your arm away. Can you see this reflex arc? So this occurs at the spinal level. These are the components. So you can see there is a receptor which is either in the skin or the receptor may be in the muscle. Here the example is shown in the skin. The receptor could be in a muscle, could be in a tendon, could be in a joint, could be anywhere in your eye like the photoreceptors, so on. Then from there it travels via sensory neuron. It goes to the integration center, which is in the central nervous system. So this integration center is in the central nervous system, which then communicates with the motor neuron. And the motor neuron goes out to the effector, which may be a muscle, which could be skeletal or smooth or cardiac, or it may be a gland. Okay, so these are the parts of a reflex arc. Now, reflexes are classified based on whether they go to skeletal muscle or they go to smooth cardiac or glandular tissue. So when they go to skeletal muscle, we call them somatic reflexes. Somatic means skeletal. And these could involve spinal nerves. For example, this, like, you know, in the lab, you all may have done, you know, you, you struck the patellar tendon and the person's um, knee sort of extended. So that was, a you know, using the femoral nerve, which was a spinal nerve. Or it could use a cranial nerve. For, and again, I'll show you examples where if you touch, for example, the cornea of your eye or you touch the surface of your eyeball, the conjunctiva, your eyes close, right? There it's using cranial nerves because when you touch... You, you stimulate the fifth cranial nerve and it goes to the seventh, which makes you blink, which is because of the orbicularis oculi. So again, that's skeletal muscle, but using cranial nerves, okay? So it could be a somatic, or I mean, it could be somatic spinal or somatic cranial, depending on which nerve is stimulated. Or it could be autonomic, in which case it would be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or it could be a gland which secretes like the lacrimal gland or the salivary gland um, or even the glands of your digestive tract. Okay, so that we would call an autonomic reflex. Remember, anything autonomic has to do with, we've been doing this autonomic nervous system over and over again and saying that that's what supplies smooth muscle, that's what supplies cardiac muscle, that's what supplies glands. Somatic nerves supply skeletal muscle, okay? So let's look at some examples of a somatic reflex. The first one I gave you in the previous one I showed was saying that imagine if you touch something hot or you prick yourself and you kind of remove your hand away from that area. Another kind of somatic reflex is where this involves a tendon. And this is the one which we do in the lab where we kind of tap a tendon and the muscle contracts. This one is called a stretch reflex. The reason it's called stretch reflex is that when you, I'll just show you this example, when you t uh, tap the tendon, what happens is you distort the tendon, you actually stretch it because when you push on the tendon, the tendon gets stretched. 
So when it gets stretched, it sets about the reflex. So that's why this is known as a stretch reflex. So here, everything is the same. You still have those five components. You'll have a receptor, you'll have a sensory neuron, you'll have the integration center, you'll have a motor neuron, and you'll have the effector. So here, the reason why you have these stretch reflexes is that, remember in that motor integration, we said the brain controls activity of these vent ventral horn cells. So what happens is that the brain sends commands to a motor neuron and it kind of says that this muscle should contract to this length. Nothing more, nothing less. Suppose that that area of the muscle is stretched, then what happens is that, you know, obviously that length which was set has been disturbed. So to bring it back to the same length, this reflex takes place, okay? So the purpose of this stretch reflex is to ensure that the muscles stay at the length which was set by the brain. So if your quadriceps had to contract only so much, it should remain at that length. So that's why we have that. And they help to maintain posture and balance. So in your, uh, you know, in regular life, for example, if you kind of tilt, uh, you know, like you were standing on one leg and you bend over too much, there's like, you're likely to tip over, right? I mean, sometimes you can't help it. You bend so much that you do tip over. But sometimes you kind of, uh, you know, it's quickly adjust and you come back. That's how because that area stretched so much, the body immediately sets about a writing reflex, so makes you upright again. So you can see how it maintains posture and balance, okay? So they, what stretch, remember when we were doing um, muscle and we talked of um, prime movers for any action, we had a prime mover and I said that if a prime mover contracts, its antagonist has to relax, isn't it? If the antagonist didn't relax, the prime mover wouldn't be able to contract. Because when one contracts, the other has to relax and stretch, allow itself to be stretched so that movement can come about. If both contracted at the same time, no movement will occur, right? So now what we are talking about is how is it that one contracts and one relaxes, right? That is because of the nervous system. And what happens in the nervous system is that when one area is stimulated, it causes contraction of that muscle, but those very same sensory impulses, they go to the spinal cord and they cause inhibition of the opposite or antagonistic muscles, making sure that the antagonist relaxes. That's how when we say prime movers contract, antagonists relax. Remember, all muscles in order to do their job needed a nerve supply. So here what we are tying is how the nervous system is actually ensuring that when one muscle is contracting, the other one is relaxing, okay? So let's look at and that kind of, um, that system where one contracts and, and the other one relaxes, that is known as reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal meaning one is contracting, the other muscle is relaxing. So let's look at this example here. So if you pay attention, so let's say I tap the surface of your biceps, the biceps tendon is stretched, and inside the muscle, there are certain receptors called muscle spindles. So the muscle spindle is a receptor that gets stimulated because of the stretch. So it, through its sensory neuron, takes the impulse to the spinal cord with the cell body lying in this dorsal root ganglion. So notice it's taking its impulse into the central nervous system. Here, it makes contact with a motor neuron. The plus sign means it stimulates the motor neuron. This motor neuron will go to the biceps muscle. I just used biceps as an example. So it goes to the biceps muscle and makes the biceps contract. But at the same time, we want the triceps to relax, isn't it? Because it's the antagonistic muscle. Suppose I was doing flexion at the elbow joint. Can you see just by tapping on the biceps tendon, this same impulse while it's coming here and synapsing on the motor neuron which is going to stimulate the biceps can you see it also synapses on an interneuron that interneuron inhibits can you see this minus or negative sign means it inhibits it inhibits the neuron which is going to the antagonistic muscle so with the result the antagonistic muscle relaxes and that's how movement is brought about can you see that so while one muscle is being stimulated, the other one is being inhibited because of stimulation of one motor neuron and inhibition of another motor neuron. It just so happens these two muscles are supplied by the same segments of the spinal cord, okay? So this kind of stimulating one and inhibiting another is known as reciprocal inhibition, okay? Follow? 
So this is a stretch reflex because you tap on a tendon, you're causing stretch of the tendon and one muscle contracts and the opposite muscle relaxes. Let's give an example of this and this you all should have done in the lab because I know some of us did do this in the lab. So, you know, or if you go to a doctor's office, they tell you to kind of sit at the edge of the table and, you know, let your legs hang loose and they tap on the patellar tendon, right? The tendon of the quadriceps. So when you tap on this patellar tendon, what happens is this tendon will get distorted like that. Can you see that when you're tapping here this way? So when it gets distorted, it is stretched. When it is stretched, it stimulates the muscle spindles inside it. They take the impulses to the central nervous system. In Here it's the spinal cord where they synapse on a motor neuron which comes and stimulates the quadriceps femoris and immediately your quadriceps contract and your leg sort of straightens out. At the same time, can you see they, are, they go and stimulate an interneuron which inhibits a nerve fiber which is going to the hamstring muscles. Remember the hamstrings are the do the opposite action of the quadriceps. Quadriceps extend the knee joint, hamstrings flex the knee joint. So here they inhibit the hamstring so that the hamstrings can stretch enough to allow the quadriceps to extend the knee joint. Follow that? So one is stimulated, the other one is inhibited. So this is known as reciprocal inhibition. And this action of tapping on a tendon and causing contraction of the muscle is known as a spinal stretch reflex. Spinal because it's involving the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Stretch because when you tap on the tendon, you're stretching the tendon. Okay. So this is also called somatic spinal stretch reflex. Whenever we use the word somatic, we are talking of going to skeletal muscle. Okay. Followed? This also explains some other reflexes which occur in your body and some of these you probably never pay attention to. You know what happens is somebody comes um, at you, someone comes with an, um, or hopefully no one will ever do that, but even, you know, playfully when you're kids or something like that, you know, you're playing with each other, someone comes towards you, the side at, at which they are coming, your tendency is kind of to take your hand or arm towards that side and protect your face and with the opposite hand you kind of try to push them away isn't it you try to do that that's kind of a protective reflex which we automatically do so can you see one side is doing this and the other side is doing the opposite action the same thing holds true for example if you were to stand on one leg like when you stand on one leg you can balance yourself right so the flexors you know if I was to flex my knee on one side but I can see my opposite leg is extended because that's the only way I can balance myself. Both are happening at the same time. One side is being flexed, one side is being extended. How does this happen in the spinal cord? So this is basically just showing that. This is called a flexor and crossed extensor. So the name sounds very big and complicated, but it's a very, very simple uh, concept to follow. In other words, one side is flexing, but at the same time, the other side is uh, extending and the stimulus is only happening on one side like I said you, if someone comes towards your right side you kind of flex your right side but you extend your left nothing happened on the left but you still extend your left right so that's why it's called flexor and crossed extensor because the opposite side is doing an extension and this is uh, and the way it happens is if you just look at this picture so imagine for example up here from the flexor you have you know somebody comes towards this side and, you know, you're trying to protect yourself. So the flexors get stimulated up here. But on the opposite side, can you see this impulse which comes here, this sensory impulse, it crosses to the opposite side. And can you see it now stimulates the extensors on the opposite side and inhibits the flexor. So that's what is meant by flexor and crossed extensor. So can you see the stimulus on one side excites the flexors on that side but the impulses also cross over and they excite the extensors on the opposite side, the opposite, just so that you can protect yourself. The same thing is that imagine you were flexing this leg and you were standing on this leg. This leg would be flexed, this leg would be extended, and that's how you're able to maintain your balance. Okay, so for example, if I did this, if I wanted to kick something with this leg and I flex this leg, but I still have to support myself on the other side, right? How am I able to do that? Because the stimulus is just from this side. It's because of this crossed extensor reflex, okay? Just to show you how it's 
it's not as simple as just going to one side. How these neural connections kind of cross and they go to opposite sides. And we can't very simply explain something of just coming here, synapsing here and going out. You can see there are multiple synapses all over your body which explain a lot of activities which you do in everyday life without even thinking about it. Okay? Now, those reflexes which I just showed you, if you notice, they all involved just the spinal cord. Can you see this was just the spinal cord? If you look here, just the spinal cord. But there are certain reflexes which n involve not only the spinal cord, but they actually go travel all the way up to the brain and then come down and, you know, come out. Some of these reflexes are what are called plantar, chromasteric, and the abdominal reflex. The plantar reflex is one where if, uh, and this is often done at a doctor's office, we normally never have to really, um, in our daily lives, we never really have this plantar reflex. They just try to see, the, when they do it in your doctor's office, they're trying to see the integrity of the descending tracks. So what they do in a doctor's office is that on the sole of your foot, they'll take the edge of a, you know, the hammer, which they use to uh, elicit tendon reflexes or even with a key or something. They stroke uh, the sole along the lateral side like this and come towards the medial side. So they go in this direction. The normal tendency is for your fing the toes to flex like this, so to curl in this way. This is the normal tendency, you know. Um, if the descending, there's a problem with the descending pathways or something, the toes actually fan out this way. So that, that tells you that's one of, they don't know exactly why it happens, but they, that tells you that the descending pathways, something has gone wrong. Ones that you would be aware of are the two, which are the cremasteric and the abdominal reflexes. In men, this cremasteric reflex is seen only in men. In men, the testes lie outside the body because they need a lower body temperature to be functional. However, the, test, the fact that the testes lie outside the body also makes them vulnerable to injury. So if you ever, uh, in a, you know, in a doctor's office or something, if you stroke the medial side of a man's thigh, what will happen is it's seen as a sign uh, of, you know, some intimidation. So automatically the, the testes gets pulled out, up from the scrotal sac and it goes into a little canal. Or if you try to kick a guy towards the scrotum, that's the automatic reaction. The testes kind of gets pulled up because it's a protective reflex, okay? Uh, so that's one. The other, which happens in all of us, is the abdominal reflex. You know, if anybody tries to come and punch towards, towards your abdomen, your instinct, if someone, you know, even makes a gesture, you instinctively uh, contract your abdominal muscle. So that's an abdominal protective reflex, okay? So these reflexes, what happens is notice how they go from either the sole of the foot or the abdomen or the, um, you know, the medial side of the thigh, they travel, they get into the spinal cord, they synapse there, from here they'll synapse at the thalamus, I haven't shown that. They go to the parietal lobe, which is the sensory area of the brain, from that uh, there a neuron will connect it to the motor area, fibers come down and then they synapse on the anterior horn and then from here it goes to the muscles. So can you see these involve the higher pathways as well? They don't just involve the spinal cord. So these reflexes are known as superficial reflexes and they are protective in nature. Okay? So if imagine if there was a blockage here, these superficial reflexes would go. Spinal reflexes would still continue because they just involve the spinal cord, but these will go. Now, I told you that somatic reflexes, so just to go back, somatic reflexes involved, so if we look at this slide, so when we were doing at the reflex arc, I said reflexes may be somatic or autonomic. Somatic were involving spinal or cranial nerves. These examples I showed you of the patella and here of this crossed extensor where we are using the hand, um, the whole limb, this is again spinal nerve. Um, and here again, when I'm talking about the foot or I'm talking about the abdomen or I'm talking about the cremaster, again, it's all spinal nerves. But somatic reflexes may also involve cranial nerves and these all still carry, so these are still somatic. 
they involve crane instead of involving spinal nerves they involve cranial nerves and they still have the same five uh, um, parts of the reflex are they will have a a, a receptor they will have a sensory neuron they'll have the integration center they'll have a motor neuron and they'll have an effector okay they all, they'll still have all of that the only difference is that instead of involving the spinal cord it will involve the brain because that's where the spi cranial nerves come out from and um, it will involve the muscles which are supplied by those cranial nerves okay one very good example is this corneal reflex it could also be called the conjunctival reflex on the surface of your eyeball is a very thin transparent membrane called the conjunctiva so imagine if i took a wisp of cotton and i tried to or even an eyelash when it falls into your eye what is your tendency first thing is you tend to blink and you want to get it out or you know so a little bit of dirt comes you kind of uh, do that if someone you know just touches your eyeball lightly uh, you blink right so how is that blinking action done when you blink which muscle do you use the orbicularis oculi remember we did that in muscular system that's the one which causes you to blink so imagine touching the surface of the cornea or the conjunctiva that area on that surface the fifth cranial nerve is the nerve which carries the sensations so the receptors are present here on the cornea or conjunctiva so from those receptors then it's the sensory neuron here the fifth cranial nerve it goes to the brain it goes to this part of the brain the pons so the fifth cranial nerve is the sensory nerve which is carrying it to the pons in the pons it goes to an area like in the spinal cord the gray matter was you know in the form of dorsal horn and ventral horn like this right but in the case of the brain we don't have a dorsal horn or ventral horn so these are very similar to dorsal horn and this is very similar to ventral horn okay so it goes and synapses in the cell bodies of the fifth nerve from there one interneuron connects it to the seventh nerve remember how the sensory neuron was connected to the motor neuron same way seventh nerve is the one which goes to the orbicularis oculi and it makes the muscle contract so that's how you blink right so you can see the so cranial reflex is very similar to spinal the difference being that the two limbs the sensory and the motor are not necessarily carried by the same cranial nerve can you see here it was fifth and here it was seventh whereas in the spinal reflex it's carried by the same spinal nerve right so here you can see in the corneal reflex it involves the fifth and the seventh nerve the afferent or sensory limb is the fifth nerve the efferent or motor limb is the seventh nerve which goes to the orbicularis oculi muscle another example is if i you know if you take a tongue depressor and press the back of your tongue many of us gag right that that's because when you touch the side of your tongue or the back of your pharynx very close to that uh, the ninth cranial nerve gets stimulated and it goes and does the same thing so here it would be the ninth it comes and contacts makes a contact with the 10th cranial nerve which causes the muscles of the pharynx to contract and that's why you have that gag reflex so these are reflexes which involve the cranial nerves very similar to spinal the only difference being that it's not the same nerve which is the afferent and the efferent they are different nerves okay so in the corneal it was the 5th and the 7th in the um, gag reflex it's the 9th and the 10th okay then now we come to this autonomic nervous system that we've been talking about all the time we've kind of mentioned it in the you know sporadically first thing remember the somatic nervous system was what we talked all this while somatic meaning coming going to skeletal muscle or bringing sensations from the skin and you know all of the skin and mus so um, skeletal muscle or joints and so on right so somatic nervous system had both a sensory and a motor component autonomic nervous system has only motor component so it only goes to muscles it doesn't bring information from anywhere and which muscles does it go to it goes to cardiac smooth muscle and glands so you'll say but glands are not muscles so how is it going to glands what happens with glands is when you actually look at a gland so if i draw a gland like this glands actually have a little tiny muscle very close to them this muscle is called a myoepithelial cell 
when this autonomic fiber supplies the muscle, this small muscle, that small muscle actually squeezes. When it squeezes, it makes this gland pour its secretions out. You all did sweat glands and, and, and sebaceous glands in the skin, right? So that's, they all really have tiny muscles at the base, which when they are, um, when the nervous, autonomic nervous system stimulates them, it causes, it con causes its contraction, it squeezes the gland and the gland pours its secretion. So it's a motor system, involuntary, because you have no control over it, goes to cardiac, smooth muscle and glands. It has two divisions, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic and parasympathetic have opposite actions. So if you remember one, you know that the other one. This is very important. If you look at a somatic nervous system, the spinal nerve, for example. So let's look here at this, or even the cranial nerve, but look here. So when we look at these anterior horn cells or ventral horn cells, can you see this nerve, this motor nerve? It begins from here, goes all the way to the muscle. So if this was in the biceps, you know, it'll go from the spinal cord to the biceps. If it, the, it was a muscle deep down in the leg, let's say uh, one of the muscles which goes to the foot, this will go all the way down like that. It'll be a very long nerve and it'll go there, right? So it's a single nerve, can you see, which is going to the muscle, okay? Even in, so this was cra uh, spinal. Look at cranial nerves too. Can you see the seventh cranial nerve begins in the brain, comes out and goes all the way to the orbicularis ocula. Just one nerve all the way to the end, okay? In the case of autonomic, it doesn't do that. It actually has like, it's almost like it's got a toll booth in between. That toll booth where it has to pay toll is known as a ganglion. So what happens in an autonomic fiber is that if I used, uh, let me say if I used this example. So in an autonomic fiber, first of all, the fiber will start, we'll show you that. It starts from a lateral horn. So it begins from here. It comes out, all motor fibers come out through the, and let me use another color. All motor fibers, if you remember, always come out through the, through the ventral root. So it comes out through here. And somewhere here, actually, there's a little ganglion present. So it will synapse here and then go out. So there'll be two neurons. Can you see this? Or it will come out through here and it, it, the ganglion may not be here. It may travel like that. The ganglion may be near an organ. Let's say if this is the heart, there's a ganglion here. It will synapse here and then go to the organ. So anyway, whether it's here or here, you always have two neurons, motor neurons, in the case of autonomic fibers. These ganglia are therefore motor ganglia, isn't it? Because they have motor cells. These ganglia will be motor ganglia. Remember this ganglion, this dorsal root ganglion is a sensory ganglion, right? Which has pseudo unipolar neurons, okay? So these will be motor ganglion. The fiber which is before the ganglion is called preganglionic. The fiber which is after the ganglion will be called postganglionic. Make sense? Pre and post, okay? So... So there's a ganglion interspersed in its journey from the central nervous system to the effector organ. So whereas somatic nervous system uses only one neuron, autonomic use two. So cell bodies of motor neurons therefore are seen both in the CNS and outside the CNS in those autonomic ganglia. Somatic nervous system has those motor neurons only in the central nervous system and they have it in the ventral horn. The somatic nervous system has it in the ventral horn. The autonomic nervous system has it in the lateral horn, which is in the CNS, and it has it in the autonomic ganglia. So that's how they are preganglionic and postganglionic. Also, in the somatic nervous system, the neurotransmitter which is used is only acetylcholine. Whereas in the autonomic nervous system, they use acetylcholine and epinephrine and norepinephrine. They also call adrenaline and noradrenaline. So the you know types of neurotransmitters are different. So neurons which use acetylcholine, we call them cholinergic. Neurons which use epinephrine or norepinephrine, since they are called adrenaline and noradrenaline, we call them adrenergic. Okay, so that's it's just a different name for them called. Cholinergic or adrenergic? Cholinergic neurons use 
acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. Adrenergic neurons use adrenaline or noradrenaline. The, the other word is epinephrine or norepinephrine. So here is the example of what I was showing. So look at a somatic nervous system. This motor cell body is lying in that ventral horn. It comes all the way out till it reaches the muscle and there it liberates acetylcholine. The autonomic nervous system has two parts, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system, so they begin in this lateral horn, these cells. They come and they reach a ganglion. So these are called preganglionic because they are before the ganglion. You don't have to remember whether it's lightly myelinated or not non-myelinated. Then the postganglionic neuron starts and then it goes to the target organ where it liberates norepinephrine or epinephrine or epinephrine. So the target organs are, for example, the smooth muscle or glands. In the case of parasympathetic, same thing. Begins in the lateral horn, comes to the ganglions, liberates acetylcholine here, and then even the postganglionic fiber liberates acetylcholine. So parasympathetic uses acetylcholine, sympathetic uses acetylcholine and epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay? Acetylcholine is in this ganglion. Epinephrine and norepinephrine is at the target organ. So this is a good slide to just, you know, review. Tells you everything. The sympathetic nervous system. How do you remember its functions and, you know, other things about it? First of all, it, first of all it's a system which is uh, one that puts you on alert. So everything it does is to make sure that you can fight, you can take flight, run really fast, right? And you might even get frightened because of certain things which make you react, you know, take fight or flight. Here, as I said, the neurotransmitter is epinephrine and norepinephrine at the target organs. That means at smooth muscle and the glands, that's what it secretes. But in the ganglia, it's acetylcholine. Any organ which has a blood supply will have sympathetic supply because sympathetic nervous system is the one which supplies blood vessels. In our body, almost all organs have a blood supply. There are only certain structures which don't have a blood supply, like the epithelium doesn't have a blood supply. Your lens of the eye doesn't have a blood supply. The cornea doesn't have a blood supply. So these areas lack sympathetic. But every other part of the body, because it has a blood supply, automatically gets a sympathetic supply. This sympathetic nervous system, we will see, it originates from the lateral horns of the thoracic 1 to lumbar 2 segments of the spinal cord. So therefore, it's called thoracolumbar outflow. What this means is that if you look at the spinal cord here, remember the spinal cord, remember how we divided it had 8 cervical segments, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 1 coccygeal, right? So if I say it from the thoracic 1, to all of thoracic 12 and then lumbar 1 and 2. So T1 to L2. These areas have lateral gray horns and the sympathetic nervous system begins from there. So since it exits from that area, we call it thoracolumbar outflow. The ganglia, remember autonomic nervous system had to have those ganglia. These ganglia are connected to the spinal nerves and they are connected to the ventral rami of spinal nerves and they form, each ganglion gets connected to the one above and below it. So they form what is called a sympathetic chain. Or the ganglia, if the ganglia may be present here by the side of the vertebral column or they may also be present in front of the aorta. So these are called Sympathetic chain or these are called pre-vertebral ganglia. I'll, I'll show you in the picture. So the synapse has to be in one of these areas. It either has to be in the sympathetic chain or it has to be in this pre-vertebral because there's only one synapse. There have to be only two of those motor neurons. So as it says, the pre-ganglionic uh, fibers synapse in one of these ganglion and post-ganglionic fibers supply smooth muscle of all the blood vessels smooth muscles of organs and erector pylorum, which is in your skin. They also supply cardiac muscle and they supply sweat glands. 
the actions of the sympathetic nervous system put the body on high alert. So everything during times of stress is what the sympathetic nervous system will do. So let's look at those ganglia that I'm describing. So here's the spinal cord up here. So this part of the spinal cord is the cervical region. So this is the cervical region. This here is the thoracic. So if we bring it down this way. So let's say the thoracic ends here and lumbar begins here. So L1 and L2. So till this point, you have this lateral horn present. So these nerves come out. And either you have these ganglia, as you can see here, these ganglia, which are very close to the spinal cord. So these are called, and they, can you see, they, they form a little chain like this. Each one is connected to the one another. So can you see that? Like, so that's why they're called a sympathetic trunk or a sympathetic chain. Or these ganglia may be present, these ganglia, and they don't show it here, they may be present somewhere here in front of the aorta where we call them pre-vertebral ganglia. Pre-vertebral meaning in front of the vertebra. So the fibers come out from here. Some of these fibers may not synapse here. They may go right through. So they may go right through like that, synapse here, and then go to the organ. Can you see that? Okay. So this is the sympathetic nervous system. So you can see beginning in the lateral horn, the, gang, the preganglionic either synapse in the ganglia close to the spinal cord or they'll go right out and synapse in those ganglia further away. And then the second neuron will start and that's how they go to supply the, the smooth muscle in the eye which, which determines what the size of your pupil will be. They will go to supply blood vessels. They'll go to supply muscles of the heart. They'll go to supply muscles of the uh, bronchi in the lungs. Now, what are the actions? So think about it. When you're scared, what happens to your heart rate? It goes up, right? So that the heart can pump more blood out. Heart pumps more blood out. Your blood pressure also goes up, right? At the same time, you begin to breathe more deeply and more often because so that you can take in as much air, air and oxygen into your lungs to send it to the, uh, you know, your brain and other parts. So you increase your respiration. You also begin to sweat because remember, sympathetic supplies the sweat gland. So when, when you're scared, you all know, we, you know, we say he was sweating with fear because it's a sympathetic system which acts. Um, when you're feeling, when you're, simp when you're sort of scared, do you want your, do you want to be able to breathe easily or you want to have trouble breathing? You want to breathe easily, right? So in order to breathe easily, your bronchi have to dilate. So your, it causes bronchial dilation. Now it causes blood vessels to constrict in most areas. Like you don't want blood to be going to your skin on your body and your face because it's not needed there. Instead, you want to shunt blood to your brain so that you can think better. You want to shunt blood to your heart so that your heart muscle can contract better and push blood out. You want to send blood to your skeletal muscles so that they can contract if you have to run somewhere, right? So these three areas, the vessels dilate. But everywhere else, like your skin, your gastrointestinal tract, the blood vessels constrict. This is the reason when some, don't we say that person looked pale with fear, right? Because the blood vessels have constricted so the skin looks really pale, okay? So it causes vasoconstriction in most areas. Vasoconstriction means constriction of blood vessels. But to the heart, skeletal muscle, and even and um, the brain, heart, skeletal muscle, and brain, it causes vasodilation. Now, do you want your pupillary muscles to constrict or dilate when you are scared? You know, they say pupils dilated with fear. The reason is if your pupils dilate, you can pass more light inside. If more light goes into your eye, you'll be able to see better, isn't it? So you want to be able to see better so you can do what you have to do better. So that's why it causes pupillary dilation because the pupils are, the diameter of the pupil is determined by smooth muscles. Sphincter pupillae for constriction and dilator pupillae for dilation. <clears throat> Then at this time, when you're running away and scared, you don't want your gastrointestinal system to be working. You don't want to be passing urine at that time. I mean, though, of course, sometimes people pee when they are really, really scared. And that's because of, you know, that, that system is overridden. So it relaxes the muscles of your gastrointestinal tract and urinary tract, but con constricts the sphincter. And usually little children kind of pee when they're scared. And that's because the higher centers haven't yet established control. 
and this is this system is really important for short term stress it cannot kind of tide you over because you need to react really fast so for short term stress this is the system that comes into play when you compare this to the parasympathetic system this is a easy going you know like laid back system so it's an at rest system here the neurotransmitters acetylcholine this system like we said the sympathetic originated from the t1 to l2 segments of the spinal cord the parasympathetic originates from the brain and the spinal cord the sympathetic didn't originate from the brain it only took part from t1 to l2 parasympathetic however begins in the brain in association with four cranial nerve nuclei those four are 3 7 9 and 10 so when those cranial nerves come out the parasympathetic sort of hitch hikes with those cranial nerves so if these four cranial nerves come out the parasympathetic which i'm going to draw in uh, let's say red they hitch hike with it so they travel with the third they travel with the seventh they travel with the ninth and they travel with the tenth because cranial nerves go to skeletal muscle right but these parasympathetic hitch hike with these cranial nerves and go to supply smooth muscle and glands and cardiac muscle and they also arise from the lateral horns in the sacral segments sacral 2 3 and 4 from these sacral segments so they come out with the these three spinal nerves sacral 2 3 4 so since it comes from the brain and spinal cord brain meaning cranio and spinal cord the sacral part this is also called the cranio sacral outflow again since it's autonomic it has to have it has to begin commence synapse in a ganglion and then the second fiber has to start right you have to have two neurons so here the ganglia are either connected to cranial nerves or the ganglia are in the walls of the organ So the preganglionic fibers will synapse in the ganglion and postganglionic fibers supply smooth muscle of organs and cardiac muscle they supply all the glands almost except those sweat glands you know and those sebaceous but they supply your lacrimal gland salivary gland glands of your respiratory and digestive system because all these glands act when you're at rest right your uh, salivary glands act when you're digesting something your gastrointestinal when you're digesting you know your respiratory again when you're being at rest so actions of the parasympathetic put the body in a restful state so you know just at, at peace like right now your parasympathetic is acting you know you probably had dinner you're digesting your dinner or at least you're thinking of something you know maybe i'm going to go home and have a juicy steak or something like that okay so here see that what it does juicy steak it increases salivation so look here where it's taking origin so see that's why i always tell you pay attention to the pictures by looking at these pictures it tells you look it takes origin with third seventh ninth and tenth cranial nerves and the sacral 2 to 4 segments of the spinal cord see it just comes out with them and notice how here it's got ganglia in relation to the cranial nerves or it has ganglia within the walls of the organs as you can see here so because it supplies those glands it will stimulate them so it causes salivation through the 7th and the 9th cranial nerves remember when you were doing functions of cranial nerves this was one of them lacrimation through the 7th when you tear up that's your lacrimal gland acting secretions from the gastrointestinal tract that's the 10th causes your gastrointestinal tract to contract and peristalt again digestive activity this is the time when you can pee in peace so it causes contraction of the bladder relaxation of the sphincter so you can you know pass urine normally and does the exact opposite of the sympathetic because it puts your body at a restful state so you don't want your heart to be pounding and your pupils to be dilating and you don't want to be sweating so that's why it doesn't even supply sweat glands so it decreases your heart rate and respiration so you know everything comes down to normal constriction of bronchi in other words when i say constriction it's not like it makes you sort of go into a spasm or anything but you know you don't need to be your bronchi don't need to be dilate dilated just the normal constriction so you can still breathe properly 
your pupils don't have to dilate because their constriction is enough to let light pass through i mean you all must have done this pupillary light reflex in the lab like when you shown a flat flashlight in someone's eye and you noticed how the pupils constricted because that was a protective reflex because when you shine light you don't want the eyes to allow all that light to pass through so they constrict okay so that's a parasympathetic and accommodation is increasing the curvature of the lens so that if you look at something distant and then come nearby you're able to focus immediately so this is the third cranial nerve so you can see how third seventh ninth and tenth so how it all these nerves help it to do that and in case of the uh, bladder and so on it's the sacral nerve so these nerves okay so let's look at a few questions and tell me so someone who's breathing rapidly dilated pupils pounding heart almost because they were almost carjacked so which part of the nervous system was acting in their case I should be able to answer this really quickly. The sympathetic nervous system. Yes, remember alert some keeping you alert so this is the sympathetic nervous system the uh, you know when you're carjacked you don't want to be digesting your food at that time right or wanting to go to the loo the bathroom at that time you want to kind of make sure you you run away from that area so it's just sympathetic it helps you do all of this okay here you just ate your dinner sitting in class digesting your meal which system do you think is active at this time parasympathetic yes very good so now let's look at some receptors remember in when we were doing the sense when we did the somatic nervous system and we talked of sensory receptors i told you they were like thermoreceptors chemoreceptors remember mechanoreceptors i gave you some example photoreceptors like rods and cones we gave them different names merkel's disc and so on right So in the case of autonomic nervous system since these are a little bit different so in the muscle we have these receptors so based on which kind of um neurotransmitter is produced by that system we, the receptors are different so we have some acetylcholine receptors and the two examples of these acetylcholine are called nicotinic and muscarinic receptors so these are the two types and then those ones which respond to uh uh which are part of uh, adrenaline or epinephrine or epinephrine these are called adrenergic receptors and there are two types they're called alpha and beta receptors some re one responds to epinephrine more one responds to norepinephrine more you don't have to worry which does which, to which but the way you i mean you you may have heard of these receptors um, you know some of you may have parents or grandparents who they tell you that they have high blood pressure and they are on something called beta blockers you i'm sure some of you've heard of that word beta blockers right that beta blocking is this because beta blocker means what a sympathetic nervous system to raise your blood pressure right so if you give something which is going to prevent the action of sympathetic nervous system it will bring your blood pressure down so if you give them something which blocks the beta receptor where the sympathetic system cannot act can you understand how now the blood pressure will come down i mean it's a little bit more complicated than that but i'm kind of trying to show you how you can kind of get the what you're hearing about in everyday life to um, you know use that with what you're learning here now just like in the 
somatic, we did those reflexes. We did the spinal nerve reflex, the stretch reflex, and we did that cross reflex and all of that. And then we did a cranial reflex, also cranial nerve. There it was using a skeletal muscle, right, where the skeletal muscle was involved. Now, in an autonomic reflex, it's going to be either a smooth muscle that's involved or it's going to be a gland. So, for example, in a sympathetic reflex where the sympathetic system is involved, remember the function of the sympathetic system was dilation of pupil. It causes pupillary dilation. So, this is one example which is called a celiospinal reflex. Um, you know, it's difficult to elicit in the classroom because person knows what you're doing. But sometimes when you gently go and uh, without a person knowing, you just kind of gently stroke the side of their neck without them even knowing, you get scared. And if you look at their pupils, you'll notice the pupils dilate. So that's what is called the celiospinal. So it's dilation of pupil in response to stroking the skin of the neck. So when you stroke the skin of the neck, the impulses from here go all the way to the spinal cord where they come with the lateral horn, go through the sympathetic and then go to the dilator pupillae and cause dilation. Uh, the other one is if you go into dark into a dark room, what happens? Your pupils dilate, isn't it? That's a reflex because you want you cannot see, but you want more light to go in. So just the absence of light or very dim light goes into your eye, stimulates the photoreceptors, and then they make connection with the sympathetic nervous system, causing your pupils to dilate. Okay. Another example is sweating. And this is a reflex which you see, like, you know, go out when it's really hot. When we did a homeostasis right in the introductory lecture, and you go out, the stimulus is that heat. And, you know, it goes, it goes to the hypothalamus, which comes and sends impulses to the symp uh, sympathetic nervous system, stimulates the sweat glands, and you begin to sweat. So you can see how the sympathetic is, all of these actions are actions of the sympathetic nervous system. Let's look at a parasympathetic, yes. On the first one, you said it goes into the spinal cord. Well, here, in, in the case of, because this is just is stroking the skin of the neck, so that's why, okay? Uh, but it, when it goes to the spinal cord, it will connect with the lateral horn, not the anterior horn. The lateral horn gives rise to the sympathetic fibers, okay? The pupillary light reflexes, when you shine a flashlight on the eye, the pupils constrict, okay? So here, the thing is, the light goes to the... It goes to the brain through the optic nerve. So the optic nerve carries or the second cranial nerve realizes that light has been shown. From here, it goes. this part goes to the midbrain where it connects with the third cranial nerve and the third had a parasympathetic component. And this goes to the constrictor pupillae and your pupil constricts. So it goes to the constrictor pupillae and the pupil constricts. So you can see how from the second to the third constrictor pupillae. So that's the pupillary light reflex. The idea is that your pupil, your retina doesn't get damaged by too much light falling on it. Another example seen very often is when you, just the thought of a juicy steak making you salivate, right? Or some nice tiramisu or some whatever is your favorite dessert. Um, you know, making you sort of your salivary gland secrete or even putting something in your mouth and, you know, the the act of salivating, or your even your digestive juice is flowing, or something in your eye irritating your eye and not only causing that corneal reflex, but sometimes you also begin to tear because the lacrimal gland secretes so that the tears can wash away that. So that's the lacrimation reflex, and which is what I'm trying to show you in this image. So imagine you have a foreign body in the eye which irritates your eye, and you know you blink and all that, it doesn't go away. So after some time, the lacrimal gland will secrete. So it's a glandular secretion. The moment you hear gland, you automatically think autonomic. And that uh, lacrimal fluid will wash that fluid away. So look at this. The foreign body in your eye stimulates the fifth cranial nerve, which goes to the pons. From here, it goes to the parasympathetic part of the seventh. Remember we said the, the parasympathetic fibers go with third, seventh, ninth, and tenth. So it goes to the parasympathetic part of the seventh which will go to the lacrimal gland. Your gland will secrete and you start tearing up. So again, because it's a glandular secretion, it's autonomic and the parasympathetic was the one supplying the lacrimal gland. So this is a parasympathetic reflex. Okay, let's look at the pupillary light reflex. The 
next case we're going to do is actually look at the pupillary light reflex. The afferent limb for this is going, or the sensory limb is going to be the optic nerve. Efferent limb, the motor limb, is going to be the ocular motor. So what I want you to just take a look right there. And I want you to, again, just keep looking over there. So look at the direct. We saw how our pupils consensual. constricted. Flashlight test. We're going to go from one eye to the other eye, back and forth. Both people stay down. There's no answer for it. That's your defect. So that's good. So you saw that how the after through the optic because you shine the flashlight and the optic nerve is the one for light takes it and it has to connect with the third cranial nerve which goes to the sphincter uh, pupillae and that makes it constrict. I couldn't tell from the video, but do both eyes dilate at the same time? No, constrict, constrict. I'm sorry. Constrict. Yes, they do, but actually you should, they, ideally to do what is called the consensual light reflex, you put a hand in front uh, between the two eyes so that you do this and you can see the constriction on the other side. In hers, we couldn't see it well. Yeah. But yes, both constrict. Even though only one is Yes, and that's called the consensual light reflex. Okay, so let's do a little bit of review. Tapping the patellar tendon with a hammer causes extension of the knee. What kind of reflex would this be? Very good. It's somatic stretch reflex. Remember, autonomic reflex is either glandular secretion or smooth muscle. See here, I'm saying patellar tendon. Patellar tendon belongs to quadriceps muscle, right? Quadriceps and you extend your knee. All movements of your limbs are done by skeletal muscle. So it is skeletal muscle. It's not cranial nerve because crane, here it's your knee. The limbs and upper and lower limbs and the body is supplied by spinal nerves. It's only the face, remember muscles of facial expression or mastication of pharynx and larynx that's supplied by cranial nerves. The thought of a juicy steak makes you salivate. This would be what kind of reflex? Autonomic reflex. Remember, salivation, any secretion, any kind of secretion, salivation, lacrimation, sweating, production of gastric juices, all of this is autonomic because that's glands. Uh, it is not a cranial nerve reflex here. Cranial nerve, again, somatic cranial nerve means it has to go to skeletal muscle. Here it's going to a gland making you secrete. So salivation is an autonomic reflex.